let me um, say a few things about uh, Dr. Azuma. Uh, he's widely known, widely known for being the pioneer in AR, and uh, he's cr even credited with coming up with the term augmented reality. Uh, no. So, no? <laughs> Well, sometimes I'm, sometimes I'm called defining, but I did not come up with it. Oh, okay, system. defining, which, which will be great, because then today he can define for us augmented reality, and he can tell us what the difference is between augmented reality and mixed reality. Actually, I wasn't going to do that. But. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me give you some more background. He's a principal engineer and research manager at, uh, in Intel Labs. Uh, he works with a team of engineers that are creating new computational imaging and display systems that enable augmented and mixed reality. Uh, he received his um, bachelor's in science from, in engineering from UC Berkeley, a master's and PhD in computer science from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and in 2016 he became an IEEE fellow. He serves on the steering committee for the IEEE International Symposium on Mixed and Augmented Reality. Uh, he, he has built um, one of the world's first augmented reality systems, and he wrote uh, one of the most cited papers in augmented reality. And most recently, he wrote an article with a very provocative title, The Most Important Challenge Facing Augmented Reality. And so that's what he's going to talk about today. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks for the opportunity to speak here. And as Joyce said, since I'm the first speaker, I thought, well, let's try to say something provocative here to uh, wake big people up on this. So I want to talk about the most, most important challenge facing augmented reality. And I'm just going to come out and say what I think that is. And it's about establishing AR as a new form of media, to be able to create new types of compelling experiences and storytelling uh, that's different than established media. Now, I know there are people out there who are thinking right this instantly, what? You know, this is the most important challenge that's out there. Shouldn't it be, you know, head tracking? Shouldn't it be head-worn displays? And, you know, those are all good answers, too. In fact, they're so good that we're going to have, two, you know, panels later on today that specifically, fi you know, uh, focus on that. But I wanted to get you guys thinking about, you know, something different. Like, why are people, especially in the mass market, actually going to want to use augmented reality? And what's the ramifications of whether or not we can answer this question as to whether or not AR succeeds? in the commercial mass market. So now that I've said something provocative, I have to try to justify that. Now, in order to do that, as Joyce said, I've been in AR for a long time. And if I had to make one slide that basically summarizes the history of AR applications, this is it. So when I first started working in augmented reality, I mean, it was hard. You had to build your own head-worn display. You had to build your own head tracking system. I mean, we didn't even have graphics acceleration hardware. You had to build your own graphics engine to do that. And, and as such, the only applications that we actually pursued were professional applications, because those are the only people we thought you know, might be able to put the investment in to actually use the stuff. Things like the maintenance and repair of complex equipment or medical applications. But what I want you to notice about those professional applications is that the, the, you know, the link between reality, the connection to reality is obvious and it's important. I mean, if I'm doing a, a medical visualization of my arm and this is guiding a surgeon as to where to cut, it darn well better be at the right place, right? But these kinds of applications are not why AR started to become, start to reach the, the consumer market. It started to reach the consumer market because certain forms of AR became possible on equipment that you already bought for other reasons. Things like laptops and desktops with webcams, and very much with uh, smartphones and tablets on there. So you now then were able to build different types of applications, such as the AR browsers or putting things on top of markers. And even today, most of the AR experiences that reach the commercial market are on things like smartphones. And don't even get me started on Hollywood and how that you know, distorts what people expect out of AR. Um, but if we're going to move beyond what we can do today and into new types of uh, um, uh, experiences for the consumer market, there are a lot of things that have to be done on, on the enabling technologies. Those are, of course, important. So for example, you know, there's been a lot of progress on tracking with SLAM type uh, systems and other things, but it's not that tracking is solved. We, don't, we cannot guarantee precise tracking in all situations, indoor and outdoor, all lighting conditions, all situations, all weather conditions. So that still is a problem. There's a lot of progress being made on near, near eye optical see-through displays, but of course, wide field of view is a challenge. Getting, getting, building a display in a form factor that people actually want to wear, that's a huge challenge. Um, occlusion problem, being able to co actually convincingly cover up the real world with virtual stuff in a see-through optical, that's difficult. 
and of course, being able to support focal depth cues so that these things don't cause eye strain. Um, even interfaces for, for how these AR displays are going to work. We don't have a keyboard and a mouse. And in particular, I mean, one dirty secret about most AR applications is that they really don't know much about the real world around you. So what we really, and that limits the kind of experiences that you can build. And so therefore we need progress in semantic understanding of the world around you. And this is a very active area of research. And there's two major approaches on this. One is real-time computer vision approaches, particularly driven by RGBD data. And also, or, you know, instead model the real world, build extensive databases of reality, and then connect to that. All right, but there's hope. I mean, there are billions of dollars being invested into this. I mean, uh, please don't get mad if your company is not listed on here. This is intended to be a representative sample, not a, not a comprehensive. But literally, in, in the VR and AR space now, there's billions of dollars being invested. And you know, now for equipment that's, that's specifically for the needs of AR and, and VR on that. But let's just make a big assumption. I know this is a big assumption, but I'm cautiously optimistic. Let's assume that if the companies can continue this kind of investment in here, that eventually all those types of enabling tech problems that I mentioned are solvable, okay? And you know, I would guess that you know, a good fraction of this room might agree with that, all right? Then the problem, the biggest challenge is not can we solve the enabling tech? The biggest challenge is how do we keep this investment going so that that will actually happen? Okay, and so if, if that is the scenario, that's how it plays out. This is what I foresee the AR market evolving. Um, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the nearer term, I would expect that more of the market is on those professional applications that I talked to you about in the beginning, the enterprise, the industrial, that type of stuff. In the long run, I think people are excited about AR and, and are putting these billions of dollars in investment in that because it might, along with VR, it might become the platforms of the future. AR ha has the best chance of supplanting the smartphone as, the, as, the, as basically becoming the next mobile. And some people even think, you know, when we have perfect head-worn you know, head displays that last all day and don't stand out and all that type of stuff, they said, well, you know, maybe we don't need a, any other kind of displays, right? Maybe you don't need laptop displays and tablet displays and smartphone displays or even TVs in, the, in a monitor. Everybody will just wear their displays. Well, maybe, but that's a long way down. I would say these first two lines that I'm listing here, that's, that's kind of conventional wisdom in the field. I don't, I don't think you know, many other people have said that. But what I want to try to point out is the gap, because it may be the case that for, if, if it's industry, okay, uh, that the, the total market of that may not be large enough to really justify the billions of dollars being invested in here. So that may not be sufficient. In, the, you, in that case, you really have to reach the consumer market so that everybody has one of these things. And the problem is that, you know, yes, when we have smartphone replacements, great, you know, they'll, they'll take over the world, but that could be a long time. How do you bridge that gap? How do you get to the consumer market before you have the perfect systems that replace smartphones? And to me, that's what the challenge is. That's what the answer is, is that we need new types of experiences. And I, I would say actually storytelling experiences because we need to move beyond just the, a lot of the consumer type of AR things that are more effects. You know, they're fun, they, they put things on your face, you put a hat on your head and stuff like that. Nothing wrong with that. But does that represent the pinnacle of what AR can be as, as, a, as a form of media? No, I don't think so. And anything that's longer, that has more substance, I think involves some amount of storytelling. That's why I'm saying that. And I really think that the, the kind of new compelling experiences are going to be ones where the combination of real and virtual is important, where you have a meaningful connection between the two. Because if all the power just comes from reality, then why bother with augmentation? And if all the power just comes from the virtual stuff, then why do AR? Why not just do VR, right? So let me give a, a little more specific example to kind of ho hopefully explain that point. So this was a game that was on the PS Vita. Um, so it's sort of a Mortal Kombat kind of game. You know, technically very impressive, right? Because you could have, you know, these two guys fighting each other with a background in reality and do slam tracking, so it looks like they're actually um, in integrated with the, the real world. But again, this system doesn't really know anything about the real world. It just uses the, the real world as a background. So these fighters are installed in the context of reality, but they're not really connected 
to reality. So if they were connected, then maybe one of these virtual fighters could be able to find a, you know, a real chair or something and bash the other guy's head in with it or something. Or, and the other guy you know, could, could find a brick wall, could jump behind the brick wall and be defended from the attacks on there. So I want to spend the rest of the talk talking about some hypotheses about how you actually make meaningful connections and new types of experiences in AR media. And these are the three strategies that I'm going to propose. The first is reinforcing. So reinforcing the strategy is, um, no, acknowledges that there are certain real locations that are inherently powerful, whether you augment them or not, that are compelling. And you can then try to build a new type of experience by augmenting it in an appropriate manner that attaches to the realities of that place. And then build an experience that perhaps is more powerful than either by itself. Again, so let me try to give a, an example that's a little more specific about that. Let's just say you wanted to learn about the Battle of Gettysburg. Well, you know, you could watch a feature film of that that had thousands of reenactors, star actors, a wonderful soundtrack and, and cinematography. On the other hand, and that's probably as inaccurate a reproduction of the battle as we're ever going to see, by the way, I've seen the film. Um, on the other hand, Gettysburg is a real place. And you can go there if you're so inclined. And if you do, you'll see things like, you know, uh, big grass fields, uh, stone fence, lots and lots of monuments. You won't see any reenactors. But if you go there, and, and I have, and you know why that spot is so crucial in American history. And by the way, that, that picture on the upper right, that's the, the spot of Pickett's Charge, where, which was the high water mark for the Confederacy. If you know why that spot is important, I'll tell you, it, it's powerful. It's, it's emotional just being there at the spot where those things actually occurred. So when I worked in Nokia, we thought, well, what if we can combine the best of both worlds? And so we did something called the Westwood Experience, which is the second strangest project I've ever worked on in my life. I don't have time to go through all of it. Just very briefly, it's a location-based experience where you meet a character called the Mayor of Westwood. Um, you go off into the streets of Westwood with a Nokia mobile device, and you see, uh, we see various mixed reality effects that try to turn the clock back to the year 1949. And then he tells you a story about a striking woman whom he met and he loved and he lost. But the payoff comes at the end, when he actually shows you, now I want you to meet the woman uh, that I, I've been telling you about. So I'll just show you a brief snippet of that. And there, there's audio on this. Uh, I hope there's audio. Is the... Almost there. Take a few paces to the end of the building, turn to your left you'll see a bench with her name on it. You'll see flowers and her resting place. And her name is there as well. Okay, so the entire, the entire reason the Westwood experience was where it was was because of that cemetery. And the power really came when people, you know, learned how they were actually going to meet the woman that they heard the story about. That they were, weren't going to meet her by seeing her as some kind of augmentation on a mobile device. And they weren't even going to meet her by, you know, seeing an actress who, who portrayed her. They were really going to meet her, the actual woman, in a cemetery in a crypt. The moment you enter a cemetery, it affects you. You, you think differently and you behave differently. And you know, it, it's hard for me to convey what the experience actually was. I mean, you, you, have, you had a mobile device and you could see video sequences. You saw a little bit of that um, with the um, that picture. But the, what I have to try to explain is that you know, you, in the real world, you saw what you see in the image on the left here. Of, of the crypt. And sometimes in the video sequence, you could see a one-to-one -one direct connection between the video of the burial versus what you were seeing in real life. And I'll tell you, even though, you know, even though I knew everything about it, the first time I playtested this, uh, that it, for, even for me, it was a poignant experience. And many of the people we, who, who went through this experience uh, reported that too. However, the, my favorite example of the reinforcing strategy is actually 110 stories. And this was a, an experience where if you were in or near Manhattan, it would render a depiction of where the Twin Towers should be. 
And there are two things about this that I think make it a particularly powerful experience. So number one is that, you know, even today on mobile devices, you know, you could probably render a nice photorealistic depiction of the, of the World Trade Center. But the designer, Brian August, decided not to do that. Instead, he had it rendered as if they were sketched against the sky with, with a, just an outline with a greased pencil. So this is technically easier, but to me, it, it was more compelling because it matches the story, the experience that this is trying to convey, which is that the towers aren't there and they're supposed to be there. The second aspect of this experience is that once you do this, you, you can take a picture of the augmentation and then it, and then it invites you to write a few lines, if you will, um, about this. Why did you take this picture? What does it mean to you? And if you go to the website and read some of the stories, you, you'll see that some of them are quite emotionally compelling. So I think we've proven that, with examples of Westwood and 110 Stories, that reinforcing can work. It can be a compelling strategy. Um, and the advantage is that the real world provides some of the power inherent. It doesn't have to be just all the virtual augmentations that provide the power. But also, there are clear disadvantages of this approach, right? It doesn't scale. You know, Silicon Valley is all about scaling, right? You know, you can't take 110 stories and run it outside of Manhattan. It, it's not going to work. Furthermore, you don't have freedom to just create any old experience that you want, right? It has to match to the realities of the place that you are reinforcing. And if you did something that's inappropriate, in a cemetery, then you would, you know, at, at worst be, you know, emperor, but or you know, perhaps even offensive. And of course, we don't want to do that. Um, the second strategy then is reskinning, and the reskinning strategy basically says, okay, look, there are a lot of places in the real world that are mundane, that are not particularly special. That you know, that's most of them on that. But you know, there is content. There are virtual things that we already know, stories that we already know and love, characters they're already familiar with, and can we then? impose that upon the real world? Can we convert the real world into something that meets the need of the story that you want to actually want to tell? And this is inspired by Werner Vinge's work in, in Rainbow's End, a science fiction work, where he described a concept called belief circles, which were these persistent virtual worlds that one-to-one -one match with reality. And, and this is a future world where you have perfect augmented reality systems and that you're able to then, pe people generate things so now, you know, instead of buildings, you might see medieval buildings. Instead of people walking down the street, you might see knights or, or things like that. Whatever the theme of this particular belief circle is on that. So um, at Intel, we actually did something, we tried to do something inspired on, on this. This is, this is the single most strange project I've ever been part of, um, which was Leviathan. And this is a, Leviathan is a novel by Scott Westerfeld. It was a New York Times bestseller for young adults. Um, and this is a, a science fiction book or fantasy book or, that proposes an alternate world where genetic engineering got discovered really, really early. And therefore, in some countries, a biological revolution supplanted the industrial revolution. So what does that mean? That means instead of building some you know, vehicles like dirigibles, they instead fabricate new types of living creatures to serve those purposes. So the Leviathan itself is that big is a thing that looks like a flying whale. Yes, a flying whale, all right? It's actually a new type of creature that, that, that serves the role uh, of a dirigible. So my CEO at CS 2014 wanted to make a big splash in, in storytelling at his keynote. And so we end up having to support a, a demo for that, which was absolutely a terrifying experience. <laughs> I was actually the person in the audience holding the tablet and, and seeing the view of the whale as it flew over 2,500 people, including my CEO and lots of high-ranking managers. We had one chance to get it right. Fortunately, it, it worked well enough um, on here, and we had a lot of personal versions in, in, the, in the booth, Intel booth at CES, where people could come and see a similar type of experience. This was a, in partnership with Matayo uh, that pulled this off. Um, <clears throat> but now, you may not have heard of Leviathan, but I'll bet you that you've heard of this content of Pokemon Go. I mean, Pokemon Go really gives me hope that if you take a brand that people know and love and you can map it in some appropriate way to the real world, you can make a bunch of money. I mean, reportedly, Pokemon Go has, 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 you know, has revenues over $1 billion, which I would think is, is more than any other of the recent virtual reality or augmented reality systems that, that are out there. This is reportedly. Niantic apparently has not confirmed this, so don't, don't, you know, don't take it on the... Um, but, you know, obviously it has been very popular on this. So I think Pokemon by itself proves that reskinning can work. 
If you can take virtual content, brands that, you know, characters, stories that people already know and love, and somehow merge it with the real world, the, the limitation is that, you know, we don't have perfect tracking and perfect semantic recognition in the world. So to really pull this off in general, to start with, you probably need some to, to, to change reality or to have, uh, you know, rooms or, or situations that you really know very well. But I think it's potentially powerful. Um, and finally, the third approach is remembering. And the remembering strategy also admits that, look, there's a lot of places, a lot of things in the real world that are pretty mundane, right? You know, my house is not fancy. I don't need a label on my couch. I don't need a thing that says it's from Ikea or anything like that, right? But even though the objects may be, may be mundane, the memories of what happened there, those can be very important. So, you know, if you can combine the memories with the locations where they actually happened, those could be you know, very powerful experiences. And this is kind of similar to the reinforcing strategy, except it's much more personal, all right? Because, you know, a place, a site like Gettysburg has a meaning that, that overwhelms everything else, and everybody knows and shares the same meaning of that place. But, you know, I may have a very different experience at, at Stanford than the rest of you, and I would have different memories at this particular location. So again, trying to, let's, let's make something that's a little more concrete example. So, you know, this is the spot where I got married. That's the gazebo. It, it really is. Don't ask me how long ago that was, okay? Um, and of course, I have photos and videos of this. But, you know, what if I could actually have an augmented reality version of this? What if I could see directly on that site, you know, uh, a depiction of a much younger Ronald and his bride, you know, at that site. I mean, I, I think it would be powerful. It, it might be spooky, but, you know, it, it would be something that would be, be, be very interesting. So, uh, Georgia Tech, Blair McIntyre's group, um, did an experiment called Three Angry Men. This was inspired by the work of 12 Angry Men, but, you know, you're, you're grad school, so you're trying to save money, so we'll, we'll cut it down to three people, right? And this depicts a story of, of deliberations of, on a trial. And what's interesting about this experience is that it, it has a real table with three chairs. And whenever you sit in one of the chairs, what you do is you, he you hear and see the deliberations from the perspective of that particular juror. So say, for example, you sit on the first juror, the, the one in the upper left corner. He, he's liberal. And you see, uh, you hear his inner thoughts, you see his perspective. And you, you see this other juror here on, the, on the, the big picture on the bottom right. He's prejudiced. He's a bigot. And so you perceive him as being very unreasonable on that. And, but what you can do is you can stand up, and then the story pauses, and then you can walk over to another chair, and you can sit down in, in the chair of that, that beg, uh, prejudice juror, and now the entire experience changes. And now you hear his, see his point of view and hear his thoughts, and he sees himself as being very reasonable, just kind of frustrated on that. But the, the entire scene even changes to, 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 uh, you know, to conform to his biases. So even the appearance of the African-American juror changes to conform to his prejudices. So to me, this is a very interesting, different type of, of, of experience. But one that I really love, and this is actually a VR experience, although I could see an AR version of this, is Pearl from Google Spotlight Stories. And if you haven't tried this, please, everybody, try this. Try the HMD version of this. So this is an experience where you're sitting in the front passenger seat of this wreck of an automobile, and this young woman comes in and sticks a cassette tape in, and all of a sudden, you're taken back in time. You're seeing vignettes of things from her past with her father and her friends as she's growing up. And it's hard to convey in words. I mean, it really, it's emotional, it's captivating. It was nominated for an Academy Award. But this is an ex I could easily see an AR version of this being made. On this. So memories alone, I think, are also an important way of, of doing that. And of course, these three strategies, you know, are perhaps the tip of the iceberg. There probably are many more approaches that one can do. And I think this is the most personal strategy. And one thing I really want to emphasize about this is that, you know, not all stories have to be told by professional storytellers or done by mass media, right? There are many things that, that are shared, you know, in social networks, and others that are just made by amateurs or shared with just a couple of people or a few friends on that. And there should be AR versions of that too on here. Even if it's, you know, a, a personal story just shared with a few people, that doesn't make it any less important, all right? So I'd like to conclude here, and the real question is, how do we know that we've succeeded? And my answer to that is that we will know when that's happened when AR media have the same power as traditional media, all right? We know that books, movies, operas, theater, et cetera, all have the power to, to change how we see the world, 
All right, so let me give you a non-tech example of, of, of that. So a friend of mine who I worked with had a stroke, and he's now confi confined to a powered wheelchair. And I'll tell you that uh, I see the world differently today. Even when I was walking here in Stanford, you know, I noticed where the ramps was. I noticed where the curb, uh, the, the cur so that you, did, you, did, you could take a wheelchair over the curb. I mean, these are things I never paid attention to before, but now I do. It's changed how I see the world. So if you can build air media experiences that enable you to see the world from someone, other, someone else's perspective, someone else's point of view, I don't care what perspective it is, cultural, political, sociological, whatever. And if that actually is powerful enough that it changes how he or she views the world and the belief systems by which that person makes decisions, that's powerful. That's when we succeed. Okay. So thanks again for the, the opportunity to talk. I hope I've given you a, a somewhat different perspective. I'm a technologist too, but we also have to keep in mind why people want to use this and how do you make compelling experiences that are actually going to sell these things. If you found these top, this topic interesting, you want to see more detail, the first uh, um, reference up here is a book chapter, and it gives you a lot, a lot more detail, a lot more examples of these strategies. And there's a, I have a, a position paper, a short version, that's the second reference right there. Um, that, uh, that is a short version of this talk. And uh, they're all available at my website. Uh, so thanks again, Joyce, for the opportunity to speak. And we might, do we have time for a question or two? Okay, thank you. I, I'm sorry, I'm really having a hard time hearing you. Sorry. I think your last statement was quite uh, powerful. You were saying the success, how you measure the success is by saying that I'm able to demonstrate the existing media capability, right? They, okay, okay, so you, the question is uh, my, my success metric is can we duplicate existing media? Yeah, so, so in that case, what is the additional value that this is going to bring? Okay, so what's the additional value of AR bringing? Okay, I. I Okay, let me try to re-explain that. I didn't mean that it is a truism that every form of media immediately replicates the previous forms of media. What were some of the earliest TV shows, right? It was Playhouse 90. It was taking a camera and shooting a video of, of, of a stage theater, right? But that, of course, doesn't capture the power of, of, of TV. Today, we have VR. What are people trying to do with VR? They're trying to do movies, right? But except 360 degrees around movies. Is that the ultimate expression of the, of the potential of VR? No, it's not. And we're going to have to figure out how, you know, what, how to actually do VR media. Same thing with AR. They will be different than traditional media. And I've tried to give some examples of that. That's not what I meant by, by replicating. What I meant is replicating the impact, the, 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 the emotional impact, the, the, the psychological impact something that you really know, love, that it actually can change how you feel about things and how you make decisions. We all know that great books can do that. We haven't proven that great AR experiences can do that. That's what I meant. Okay, we'll just take one more question. Hi, Steve. Okay. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, uh, I was struck by your definition of, or your approach to uh, AR is trying to look through, teach people to look through other people's eyes. And I've heard that as a definition of anthropology also, the study of anthropology, to learn how to see the world through other people's eyes. I exactly that phrase. And I'm just, I'm just curious, have you been d discussing your ideas with anthropologists? Because it sounds like it would be right up their line. I, okay, have, have we discussed the, these approaches with anthropologists uh, in terms of developing empathy or seeing the world through other people's eyes? Um, no, I, <laughs> I have not uh, dealt directly with, well, I, I suppose, you know, the, the group that I came in originally into Intel actually was headed by Genevieve Bell, and she, I think she's a, either an ethnographer or a cultural anthropologist. So we have had discussions with some people, such as Tony Shalesky, who have more of a humanities background on that. But explicitly, no, no I haven't. Uh, Sounds like a profitable way to go. But that would be a good, certainly this is an interdisciplinary field. And as I, I tried to say, some of the, to make a better experience, it doesn't necessarily mean that you, you push the technology to the max. Well, well thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Hope you're around.